Chapter 20 of The Gods of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gods of Mars. Chapter 20 The Air Battle. Two hours after leaving my palace at Helium, or about midnight, Kantos Khan, Zodar, and I arrived at Hastor. Carthoris, Tars Tarkas, and Horvastus had gone directly to Thark upon another cruiser. The transports were to get under way immediately and move slowly south. The fleet of battleships would overtake them on the morning of the second day. At Hastor we found all in readiness, and so perfectly had Kantos Khan planned every detail of the campaign that within ten minutes of our arrival the first of the fleet had soared aloft from its dock, and thereafter, at the rate of one a second, the great ships floated gracefully out into the night to form a long, thin line which stretched for miles toward the south. It was not until after we had entered the cabin of Kantos Khan that I thought to ask the date, for up to now I was not positive how long I had lain in the pits of Zad Aris. When Kantos Khan told me, I realized with a pang of dismay that I had misreckoned the time while I lay in the utter darkness of my cell. Three hundred and sixty-five days had passed. It was too late to save Dejah Thoris. The expedition was no longer one of rescue, but of revenge. I did not remind Kantos Khan of the terrible fact that ere we could hope to enter the Temple of Issus, the Princess of Helium would be no more. In so far as I knew, she might already be dead, for I did not know the exact date on which she first viewed Issus. What now the value of burdening my friends with my added personal sorrows? They had shared quite enough of them with me in the past. Hereafter I would keep my grief to myself, and so I said nothing to any other of the fact that we were too late. The expedition could yet do much if it could but teach the people of Barsoom the facts of the cruel deception that had been worked upon them for countless ages, and thus save thousands each year from the horrid fate that awaited them at the conclusion of the voluntary pilgrimage. If it could open to the red men the fair valley door, it would have accomplished much, and in the land of lost souls between the mountains of Otz and the ice barrier were many broad acres that needed no irrigation to bear rich harvests. Here at the bottom of a dying world was the only naturally productive area upon its surface. Here alone were dews and rains. Here alone was an open sea. Here was water in plenty. And all this was but the stamping ground of fierce brutes, and from its beauteous and fertile expanse the wicked remnants of two once mighty races barred all the other millions of Barsoom. Could I but succeed in once breaking down the barrier of religious superstition which had kept the red races from this El Dorado, it would be a fitting memorial to the immortal virtues of my princess. I should have again served Barsoom, and Dejah Thoris' martyrdom would not have been in vain. On the morning of the second day we raised the great fleet of transports and their consorts at the first flood of dawn, and soon were near enough to exchange signals. I may mention here that radio aerograms are seldom if ever used in wartime, or for the transmission of secret dispatches at any time, for as often as one nation discovers a new cipher, or invents a new instrument for wireless purposes, its neighbors bend every effort until they are able to intercept and translate the messages. For so long a time has this gone on that practically every possibility of wireless communication has been exhausted, and no nation dares transmit dispatches of importance in this way. Tars Tarkas reported all well with the transports. The battleships passed through to take an advanced position, and the combined fleets moved slowly over the ice cap, hugging the surface closely to prevent detection by the therns whose land we were approaching. Far in advance of all, a thin line of one-man air scouts protected us from surprise. And on either side they flanked us, while a smaller number brought up the rear some twenty miles behind the transports. In this formation we had progressed toward the entrance to Omin for several hours, when one of our scouts returned from the front to report that the cone-like summit of the entrance was in sight. At almost the same instant 
another scout from the left flank came racing toward the flagship. His very speed bespoke the importance of his information. Cantos Can and I awaited him upon the little forward deck, which corresponds with the bridge of earthly battleships. Scarcely had his tiny flyer come to rest upon the broad landing deck of the flagship, ere he was bounding up the stairway to the deck where we stood. "'A great fleet of battleships south-southeast, my prince,' he cried. "'There must be several thousands, and they are bearing down directly upon us.' "'The Thurn spies were not in the palace of John Carter for nothing,' said Cantos Can to me. "'Your orders, prince.' Dispatch ten battleships to guard the entrance to Omin, with orders to let no hostile enter or leave the shaft. That will bottle up the great fleet of the first-born. Form the balance of the battleships into a great V, with the apex pointing directly south-southeast. Order the transports, surrounded by their convoys, to follow closely in the wake of the battleships, until the point of the V has entered the enemy's line. Then the V must open outward at the apex. The battleships of each leg engage the enemy fiercely, and drive them back to form a lane through his line into which the transports with their convoys must race at top speed, that they may gain a position above the temples and gardens of the therns. Here let them land and teach the holy therns such a lesson in ferocious warfare as they will not forget for countless ages." It had not been my intention to be distracted from the main issue of the campaign, but we must settle this attack with the Therns once and for all, or there will be no peace for us while our fleet remains near door, and our chances of ever returning to the outer world will be greatly minimized. Cantos Can saluted and turned to deliver my instructions to his waiting aides. In an incredibly short space of time, the formation of the battleships changed in accordance with my commands. The ten that were to guard the way to Omin were speeding toward their destination, and the troop ships and convoys were closing up in preparation for the spurt through the lane. The order of full speed ahead was given, the fleet sprang through the air like coursing greyhounds, and in another moment the ships of the enemy were in full view. They formed a ragged line as far as the eye could reach in either direction, and about three ships deep. So sudden was our onslaught that they had no time to prepare for it. It was as unexpected as lightning from a clear sky. Every phase of my plan worked splendidly. Our huge ships mowed their way entirely through the line of Thurn battlecraft. Then the V opened up and a broad lane appeared through which the transport leapt toward the temples of the Therns, which could now be plainly seen glistening in the sunlight. By the time the Therns had rallied from the attack, a hundred thousand green warriors were already pouring through their courts and gardens, while a hundred and fifty thousand others leaned from low swinging transports to direct their almost uncanny marksmanship upon the thern soldiery that manned the ramparts, or attempted to defend the temples. Now the two great fleets closed in a titanic struggle far above the fiendish din of battle in the gorgeous gardens of the therns. Slowly the two lines of Helium's battleships joined their ends, and then commenced the circling within the line of the enemy, which is so marked a characteristic of Barsoomian naval warfare. Around and around in each other's tracks moved the ships under Cantos Can, until at length they formed nearly a perfect circle. By this time they were moving at high speed, so that they presented a difficult target for the enemy. Broadside after broadside they delivered, as each vessel came in line with the ships of the therns. The latter attempted to rush in and break up the formation, but it was like stopping a buzzsaw with the bare hand. From my position on the deck, beside Cantos Can, I saw ship after ship of the enemy take the awful, sickening dive which proclaims its total destruction. Slowly we maneuvered our circle of death until we hung above the gardens where our green warriors were engaged. The order was passed down for them to embark. Then they rose slowly to a position within the center of the circle. In the meantime, the Thurn's fire had practically ceased. They had had enough of us and were only too glad to let us go on our way in peace. But our escape was not to be encompassed with such ease for scarcely had we gotten under way once more in the direction of the entrance to Omin, than we saw, far to the north, 
a great black line topping the horizon. It could be nothing other than a fleet of war. Whose or whither bound we could not even conjecture. When they had come close enough to make us out at all, Cantos Can's operator received a radio aerogram, which he immediately handed to my companion. He read the thing and handed it to me. Cantos Can, it read. Surrender, in the name of the Jeddak of Helium, for you cannot escape. And it was signed, Zat Aris. The Therns must have caught and translated the message almost as soon as did we, for they immediately renewed hostilities when they realized that we were soon to be set upon by other enemies. Before Zat Aris had approached near enough to fire a shot, we were again hotly engaged with the Thern fleet and as soon as he drew near he too commenced to pour a terrific fusillade of heavy shot into us. Ship after ship reeled and staggered into uselessness beneath the pitiless fire that we were undergoing. The thing could not last much longer. I ordered the transports to descend again into the gardens of the therns. "'Wreak your vengeance to the utmost,' was my message to the green allies, "'for by night there will be none left to avenge your wrongs.' Presently I saw the ten battleships that had been ordered to hold the shaft of Omin. They were returning at full speed, firing their stern batteries almost continuously. There could be but one explanation. They were being pursued by another hostile fleet. Well, the situation could be no worse. The expedition already was doomed. No man that had embarked upon it would return across that dreary ice-cap. How I wished that I might face that Aris with my longsword for just an instant before I died. It was he who had caused our failure. As I watched the oncoming ten, I saw their pursuers race swiftly into sight. It was another great fleet. For a moment I could not believe my eyes, but finally I was forced to admit that the most fatal calamity had overtaken the expedition for the fleet I saw was none other than the fleet of the firstborn, that should have been safely bottled up in Omin. What a series of misfortunes and disasters! What awful fate hovered over me, that I should have been so terribly thwarted at every angle of my search for my lost love! Could it be possible that the curse of Issus was upon me? That there was, indeed, some malign divinity in that hideous carcass? I would not believe it, and throwing back my shoulders, I ran to the deck below to join my men in repelling boarders from one of the thern craft that had grappled us broadside. In the wild lust of hand-to-hand -hand combat, my old dauntless hopefulness returned. And as thern after thern went down beneath my blade, I could almost feel that we should win success in the end, even from apparent failure. My presence among the men so greatly inspirited them that they fell upon the luckless whites with such terrible ferocity that within a few moments we had turned the tables upon them, and a second later, as we swarmed their own decks, I had the satisfaction of seeing their commander take the long leap from the bows of his vessel in token of surrender and defeat. Then I joined Cantos Can. He had been watching what had taken place on the deck below and it seemed to have given him a new thought. Immediately he passed an order to one of his officers, and presently the colors of the Prince of Helium broke from every point of the flagship. A great cheer arose from the men of our own ship, a cheer that was taken up by every other vessel of our expedition as they in turn broke my colors from their upper works. Then Cantos Can sprang his coup a signal legible to every sailor of all the fleets engaged in that fierce struggle was strung aloft upon the flagship. "'Men of Helium, for the Prince of Helium, against all his enemies,' it read. Presently my colors broke from one of Zat Aris ships, then from another and another. On some we could see fierce battles waging between the Zodangan soldiery and the Heliometic crews but eventually the colors of the Prince of Helium floated above every ship that had followed Zat Aris upon our trail. Only his flagship flew them not. Zat Aris had brought five thousand ships. The sky was black with the three enormous fleets. It was Helium against the field now, and the fight had settled to countless individual duels. 
there could be little or no maneuvering of fleets in that crowded, fire-split sky. Zadar's flagship was close to my own. I could see the thin features of the man from where I stood. His Odangan crew was pouring broadside after broadside into us, and we were turning their fire with equal ferocity. Closer and closer came the two vessels, until but a few yards intervened. Grapplers and boarders lined the contiguous rails of each. We were preparing for the death struggle with our hated enemy. There was but a yard between the two mighty ships as the first grappling irons were hurled. I rushed to the deck to be with my men as they boarded. Just as the vessels came together with a slight shock, I forced my way through the lines and was the first to spring to the deck of Zadara's ship. After me poured a yelling, cheering, cursing throng of Helium's best fighting men. Nothing could withstand them in the fever of battle-lust which enthralled them. Down went the Zodangans before that surging tide of war, and as my men cleared the lower decks I sprang to the forward deck where stood Zat Aris. "'You are my prisoner, Zat Aris,' I cried. "'Yield, and you shall have quarter.' For a moment I could not tell whether he contemplated acceding to my demand or facing me with drawn sword. For an instant he stood hesitating, and then, throwing down his arms, he turned and rushed to the opposite side of the deck. Before I could overtake him he had sprung to the rail and hurled himself head foremost into the awful depths below. And thus came Zat Aris, Jed of Zodanga, to his end. On and on went that strange battle. The Therns and Blacks had not combined against us. Wherever Thern ship met ship of the firstborn was a battle royal, and in this I thought I saw our salvation. Wherever messages could be passed between us that could not be intercepted by our enemies, I passed the word that all our vessels were to withdraw from the fight as rapidly as possible, taking a position to the west and south of the combatants. I also sent an air scout to the fighting green men in the gardens below to re-embark, and to the transports to join us. My commanders were further instructed that, when engaged with an enemy, to draw him as rapidly as possible toward a ship of his hereditary foemen, and by careful maneuvering to force the two to engage, thus leaving himself free to withdraw. This stratagem worked to perfection, and just before the sun went down, I had the satisfaction of seeing all that was left of my once mighty fleet gathered nearly twenty miles southwest of the still terrific battle between the blacks and whites. I now transferred Zodar to another battleship, and sent him with all the transports and five thousand battleships directly overhead to the Temple of Issus. Carthoris and I, with Cantos Can, took the remaining ships and headed for the entrance to Omin. Our plan now was to attempt to make a combined assault upon Issus at dawn of the following day. Tars Tarkas with his green warriors and Horvastus with the red men, guided by Zodar, were to land within the garden of Issus or the surrounding plains, while Carthoris, Cantos Can, and I were to lead our smaller force from the Sea of Omin through the pits beneath the temple which Carthoris knew so well. I now learned for the first time the cause of my ten ships' retreat from the mouth of the shaft. It seemed that when they had come upon the shaft the navy of the firstborn were already issuing from its mouth. Fully twenty vessels had emerged, and though they gave battle immediately in an effort to stem the tide that rolled from the black pit, the odds against them were too great and they were forced to flee. With great caution we approached the shaft under cover of darkness. At a distance of several miles I caused the fleet to be halted, and from there Carthoris went ahead alone upon a one-man flyer to reconnoiter. In perhaps half an hour he returned to report that there was no sign of a patrol boat or of the enemy in any form, and so we moved swiftly and noiselessly forward once more toward Omin. At the mouth of the shaft we stopped again for a moment for all the vessels to reach their previously appointed stations. Then, with the flagship, I dropped quickly into the black depths, while one by one the other vessels followed me in quick succession. We had decided to stake all on the chance that we would be able to reach the temple by the subterranean way, 
and so we left no guard of vessels at the shaft's mouth. Nor would it have profited us any to have done so, for we did not have sufficient force all told to have withstood the vast navy of the firstborn had they returned to engage us. For the safety of our entrance upon Omin, we depended largely upon the very boldness of it, believing that it would be some little time before the firstborn on guard there would realize that it was an enemy and not their own returning fleet that was entering the vault of the buried sea. And such proved to be the case. In fact, four hundred of my fleet of five hundred rested safely upon the bosom of Omin before the first shot was fired. The battle was short and hot, but there could have been but one outcome, for the firstborn in the carelessness of fancied security had left but a handful of ancient and obsolete hulks to guard their mighty harbor. It was at Carthoris' suggestion that we landed our prisoners under guard upon a couple of the larger islands, and then towed the ships of the firstborn to the shaft, where we managed to wedge a number of them securely in the interior of the great well. Then we turned on the buoyance rays in the balance of them and let them rise by themselves to further block the passage to Omin, as they came into contact with the vessels already lodged there. We now felt that it would be some time at least before the returning firstborn could reach the surface of Omin, and that we would have ample opportunity to make for the subterranean passages which led to Issus. One of the first steps I took was to hasten personally with a good-sized force to the island of the submarine, which I took without resistance on the part of the small guard there. I found the submarine in its pool, and at once placed a strong guard upon it and the island, where I remained to wait the coming of Carthoris and the others. Among the prisoners was Yersted, commander of the submarine. He recognized me from the three trips that I had taken with him during my captivity among the firstborn. How does it seem, I asked him, to have the tables turned, to be a prisoner of your erstwhile captive? He smiled, a very grim smile, pregnant with hidden meaning. It will not be for long, John Carter, he replied. We have been expecting you, and we are prepared. So it would appear, I answered, for you were all ready to become my prisoners with scarce a blow struck on either side. The fleet must have missed you he said. But it will return to Omin, and then that will be a very different matter for John Carter. I do not know that the fleet has missed me as yet, I said, but of course he did not grasp my meaning and only looked puzzled. Many prisoners travel to Issus in your grim craft, Yersted? I asked. Very many, he assented. Might you remember one whom men called Dejah Thoris? Well, indeed, for her great beauty, and then, too, for the fact that she was wife to the first mortal that ever escaped from Issus through all the countless ages of her godhood, and the way that Issus remembers her best as the wife of one and the mother of another who raised their hands against the goddess of life eternal. I shuddered for fear of the cowardly revenge that I knew Issus might have taken upon the innocent Dejah Thoris for the sacrilege of her son and her husband. And where is Dejah Thoris now? I asked, knowing that he would say the words I most dreaded, but yet I loved her so that I could not refrain from hearing even the worst about her fate, so that it fell from the lips of one who had seen her but recently. It was to me as though it brought her closer to me. Yesterday the monthly rites of Issus were held, replied Yersted, and I saw her then sitting in her accustomed place at the foot of Issus. What? I cried. She is not dead, then? Why, no, replied the black. It has been no year since she gazed upon the divine glory of that radiant face of— No year? I interrupted. Why, no, insisted Yersted. It cannot have been upward of three hundred and seventy or eighty days. A great light burst upon me. How stupid I had been! I could scarcely retain an outward exhibition of my great joy— why had I forgotten the great difference in the length of Martian and earthly years? The ten earth years I had spent upon Barsoom had encompassed but five years and ninety-six days of Martian time, whose days are forty-one minutes longer than ours, 
and whose years number six hundred and eighty-seven days. I am in time. I am in time. The words surged through my brain again and again, until at last I must have voiced them audibly, for Yerstead shook his head. "'In time to save your princess?' he asked, and then, without waiting for my reply, "'No, John Carter, Isis will not give up her own. She knows that you are coming, and ere ever a vandal foot is set within the precincts of the Temple of Isis, if such a calamity should befall, Dejah Thoris will be put away for ever from the last faint hope of rescue.' "'You mean that she will be killed merely to thwart me?' I asked. "'Not that, other than as a last resort,' he replied. "'Hast ever heard of the Temple of the Sun? It is there that they will put her. It lies far within the inner court of the Temple of Issus, a little temple that raises a thin spire far above the spires and minarets of the great temple that surrounds it. Beneath it, in the ground, there lies the main body of the temple, consisting in six hundred and eighty-seven circular chambers, one below another. To each chamber a single corridor leads through solid rock from the pits of Issus. As the entire Temple of the Sun revolves once with each revolution of Barsoom about the sun, but once each year does the entrance to each separate chamber come opposite the mouth of the corridor which forms its only link to the world without. Here Issus puts those who displease her but whom she does not care to execute forthwith. Or, to punish a noble of the firstborn, she may cause him to be placed within a chamber of the Temple of the Sun for a year. Oft times she imprisons an executioner with the condemned, that death may come in a certain horrible form upon a given day. Or again, but enough food is deposited in the chamber to sustain life but the number of days that Issus has allotted for mental anguish. Thus will Dejah Thoris die, and her fate will be sealed by the first alien foot that crosses the threshold of Issus. So I was to be thwarted in the end, although I had performed the miraculous and come within a few short moments of my divine princess. Yet was I as far from her as when I stood upon the banks of the Hudson forty-eight million miles away. End of chapter 20